I invite you now to take your Bibles and turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. As you're, as you're turning there, um, uh, let me just uh, review uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, some of you uh, who were here, you, you'll re- remember that I spoke on uh, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and I tied that in with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then Pastor Dwayne last Sunday morning talked about being rooted and strengthened in the resurrection of Christ. And both of us spoke from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And some of you might think that we coordinated that. Well, we didn't. It just happened that, that way. I already knew where I was going. Dwayne already knew where he was going in terms of the message. And uh, it just so happened that it was uh, Dwayne's message, I think, was, a, was an underscoring and a reinforcement of some of the things that I had said in the previous weeks. Um, Always abounding, giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. So we talked about the resurrection and the work of the Lord. And I mentioned to you then, that's our first point, guys, if you can get that on the screen. Um, I mentioned to you then that because the resurrection of Jesus is true, we can always be giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And the reason is, because the resurrection is true, Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that we have victory over death. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore our labor in the Lord is not in vain. The message of the death and resurrection of Jesus is a message about the conquering of death itself. And so Paul concludes that great passage where he says, Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O grave, is your victory? And uh, there is no more sting to death for the believer. The grave will no longer hold us permanently because of the resurrection of our, of our Lord Jesus. So the work of the gospel, the work of the Lord, is a work that cannot be touched by death itself. And you'll remember that we defined what the work of the Lord was. The work of the Lord refers to what disciples do to advance the gospel among unbelievers and to establish disciples in the gospel. An important definition. We're not just talking about God's work in all of creation. We're talking about the work of the Lord specifically as it pertains to the the gospel. Which brings us to the second thing we need to review, and that is that disciple-making then is the work of the Lord. Jesus said we're to go into all the world and make disciples of all all nations. That's the work of the Lord. Disciple-making is at the heart of the work of the Lord. It is the work of the Lord. And this is why churches get planted, like our church was 50 years ago. And this is what churches are called to do, to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. When a church abandons the great commission of making disciples of all nations, it abandons its very reason for being. When a church adopts some other kind of, 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 of agenda, it, 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 it jettisons its very reason to exist. The local churches exist to do the work of the Lord. And we define then what disciple making is, or what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. So the work of disciple making then is bringing people to Christ, encouraging them to follow him, uh, encouraging them, helping them to be changed by the Lord Jesus, and to become committed to the mission of Jesus. So anything that we do to help people follow Christ is disciple-making. It is the work of the Lord. Now, I want to talk just briefly to you for a moment about the, uh, what I believe to be the most needed gift in the work of the Lord, the most needed gift in making disciples of the Lord Jesus. You'll remember several months back when we started in the book, the book of Acts, we started in Acts chapter 1. We, we looked at the opening words of Acts where, where Luke, the writer, writing to a man named Theophilus, a lover of God, refers to the former letter that he would wrote, which is the Gospel of Luke. And so Luke says, in, in, in my former treatise, O Theophilus, I wrote about everything that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, in those opening words in the book, the book of Acts, Luke tells us immediately what the book of Acts is all about. There's an implication there. Because if the Gospel of Luke, or all of the Gospels, record everything that Jesus began to do and to teach, the implication then is, is that even though Jesus has ascended into heaven, he is going to continue to do and to teach. 
And so in these opening verses, the next thing that follows is, is stay in the city of Jerusalem until you're covered with, with power from on high. You've heard that John baptized with water, but I tell you, not many days from now, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. That's where the work of the Lord is supposed to happen. So God gave, Christ gave his spirit to the church, to his people, to empower us in this work. And in the giving of the Holy Spirit, he also gave certain kinds of gifts. The Holy Spirit himself is a gift. He's the gift the Father promised. But the Holy Spirit, who is the gift, actually gives to us, believers in Jesus, certain kinds of gifts. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and these, these gifts are given to you and I as the church in order that we can continue to do the work of the Lord. You see, friends, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are really nothing more than a manifestation of the continuing ministry of Jesus Christ in the church and in the world. Now, what I just said is an important thing because when we think about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there's all kinds of controversy today about these gifts, but when we think of the gifts of the Spirit, we need to see them through the prism of the ministry of Jesus. In other words, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are simply different manifestations of the continuing work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the world, and these gifts have been given to you and I. Some of us have several gifts, some of us may have a few. Some of us may have many. It, we're all, it, it's, it's according to God's grace that he gives these gifts, but it's the manifestation of Jesus in us and through us to carry on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just going to go down a rabbit trail for just a moment because if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Apostle Paul addresses this whole issue of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and what he writes there is both critical and correctional. It's critical in that he is writing to a church that is misusing the gifts. They're they're not using certain gifts to carry on the ministry of Jesus. They're using certain gifts because it's all about themselves. Paul says, no, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And so it's correctional in that he gives instruction as to how the gifts of the Spirit are to be used, and his emphasis there is to build up the church. It's to build up other believers. It's it's not about building up yourself. It's not about making yourself feel good because you get to use your gift. No, it's, it's about using your gift with the motive of love. The most excellent way, Paul says. With the motive of love to build people up in their faith. And so by using the gifts... We carry on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have the time, and nor is it the purpose of this morning's message to talk about everything of concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but this morning I want to focus in on one of those gifts, which I believe, in my opinion, is the most needed gift when it comes to the work of the Lord. It's the most distributed gift within the church. It's the most needed gift within the church. It is one of the most needed gifts in the sense it's the most helpful gift in terms of encouraging people to follow Jesus, to be changed by Jesus, and to become committed to the ministry of Jesus. And you remember at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul lists some of the gifts, and then he says, covet earnestly the best gifts, or eagerly desire the greater gifts. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to magnify one of the gifts because I believe it is one of the best gifts, one of the greater gifts that we should eagerly desire. And that gift is the gift of encouraging. So in Romans chapter 12, oh, go back please. Go back please. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. And then he lists a few and then he says, if it is encouraging, let him encourage. Now you might think what, what, encouraging people is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, yes it is. See, we're all commanded to, to encourage each other but some of us have been given a gift to do so. In other words, we're just sort of wired that way by the Holy Spirit. And if that gift is encouraging, he says, let him encourage. In essence, what Paul's saying, you got that gift? Then do it. Do it. Let me try to define this. And I I found this definition very helpful. And it's our next slide. And sometimes the gift of encouragement is called the gift of exhortation. Depends how you translate the word. And um, it's the special ability that God gives to certain disciples 
which enable them to come alongside another person to give encouragement, challenge, counsel, or earnest advice as needed in such a way that a person is helped, and I would add, as a person is helped to follow the Lord. I believe in what I, what I call a gift mix. In other words, all of us have been given a number of gifts, and so there's a mix of gifts, and, and the mixture of the gifts that God has given to us is different in every person. I have a particular gift mix. I could tell you what my gifts are. You probably could guess them. Uh, I certainly have the gift of teaching, gift of preaching. I have the gift of leadership. I have the gift in evangelism. I, those are, that's kind of my gift mix. Well, every one of us has a gift mix. The gift of encouragement can be seen in the gift of teaching. If a man's a good Bible teacher and he has a gift of encouragement too, then you're gonna find his Bible teaching to be really encouraging. If a man is a leader and he also has the gift of encouraging, then you're gonna find that his leadership really brings encouragement to God's people. If someone has the gift of mercy, another one of the gifts of the Spirit, or the gift of helps, but also the gift of encourage, encouragement and the mercy that's given and the help that's given is going to be encur- encouraging. Now the, the, interesting wor- the interesting thing here about this word encouragement or encouraging or exhortation is it, it comes from a Greek word called parakleo, parakleo. Now immediately when you hear the word parakleo, you, you, you know it's in two parts. Para is the preposition. Just like in English we have things like paramedic, paralegal, <laughs> parachurch, okay? So these are, these are other individuals that come alongside a medic or come alongside, alongside a lawyer to help. And that's exactly what this word is. It, it means to come alongside of. And the second part of the word, kaleo, is, is, is a verb, and it, it's the verb to call. So parakaleo is to call alongside of to call alongside of. So the gift of encouraging then, parakaleo, has this idea of of coming to someone's aid, of coming alongside someone to assist them. It's the ability to help someone in an area where perhaps they're struggling to help themselves. So it gives to us the picture of a man or a woman who is a weary traveler in life. And they are carrying an incredible load, a burden-crushing load, that's that someone comes alongside to help them carry the load on the journey. That's parakaleo, encouraging. And the person who does this, according to the Bible, is called a paraclete. A paraclete. In the Greek language, even today, a, par- a paraclete is used to describe what a tugboat does in a harbor. You have a massive ship that comes into a small harbor. What does the tugboat do? They call for the paraclete when a big ship comes in because the paraclete, the tugboat, comes alongside and pushes on the boat, the large ship, to help that ship maneuver into the harbor or out of the harbor. It's an assisting kind of a gift. Interestingly, Jesus said, I will send to you another comforter, another paraclete the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the comforter, the one who will come alongside you. And the Apostle John tells us in 1 John chapter 2 that he's written, to these, he's written this letter to us that we will not sin, but if anyone sins, and we all do, are we left on our own then when we sin? Does God walk away from us? No, we have a paraclete, we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus. He is the one who comforts us, the encourager. So to summarize then, this is a very special gift of the Holy Spirit, but it's also a specific command that is given to us, given to all of us. And so a number of scripture verses on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is one of the verses that speak of this. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. You're, You're not commanded here, if you have the gift, do this. No, it's, it's a general command to all of us, whether you have the gift or not. Next verse, Hebrews chapter three, verse 13, encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you will be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. That's why we need encouragement. There, there, there's this constant pressure to sin. There's the constant temptation that comes. There are those areas that we struggle with and we need, sometimes we need a buddy to come alongside us and say, don't give in. Let's pray together. 
Like I know that sin is pressing in on you, but don't be deceived by it. That's this kind of encouraging ministry. Or Hebrews chapter 10, a verse which is familiar to most of us. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, the day of the return of the Lord Jesus. The scripture makes it clear what's gonna happen before Jesus comes. It's not gonna be easy. It's not easy to follow Christ in a world that rejects him. And so we need to come alongside each other and to encourage. So all of us are called to encourage, but some of us are gifted to do so. I like to call this gift the counseling gift or the comforting gift or the cheerleading gift. That's really what we're called to do. Now I want to talk to you this morning about the best example of this gift. And we go here to Acts chapter 4. And at the end of Acts chapter 4, we are introduced to the best example of this gift. This is a man who had like radar for individuals who needed to be encouraged by others. This man was a leader, he was an evangelist, he was a preacher, he was a teacher of God's word, but interestingly, it is not those things that characterized him or those things that made him shine. In other words, what really stood out about this man was not his leadership gifts or his preaching and teaching gifts. What made this man stand out and shine was the fact that he encouraged people. And so here we have him introduced to us In Acts chapter 4, verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. The first three letters, B-A-R, bar, is the the preposition, again, of the word. It simply means son of, son of, son of Abbas, which means the son of encouragement. And he sold a field, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. This man was named for the gift of the Spirit that characterized him. Now, right now at this point, what I want to talk to you about is five incidents in the life of this this man, five events in which this man was deeply involved, in which we see the encouragement gift being used. And the first one is that Barnabas encouraged the church in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. That's here, right here in Acts chapter 4, 36 and 37. So we're introduced to this man. His name is Joseph. He's from Cyprus, which is that island in the Mediterranean Sea. He is a Jew because it says he was a Levite from the the priestly tribe among the Israelite people. He would have been one of those Jews that were scattered into the Gentile world in the dispersion. And so here he is, a Greek-speaking Jew, and he's there in the church of Jerusalem. Now clearly he was an early convert to the faith because the first four chap- chapters in Acts is that very early time in the history of the formation of the, of the church in Jerusalem, the first local church that got estab- established by the apostles in those days. Barnabas was probably, we're not sure, but he was probably in that crowd of people that had come from all over the world in Acts chapter two. Remember, they'd come from all these different nations and the nations are listed there in Acts two. So he probably came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. He was one of the 3,000 we believe, who came to the Lord. Now, he is given a name. Some people say this is a nickname. The apostles referred to him as son of encouragement. I would say it's not so much a nickname as a name change. A name change. And that's important because in the Bible, there are a number of instances where people's names get changed. And there's a reason for that. Remember, Jesus said to the 12, who do you say I am? And who spoke up? Simon. And what did he say? You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. What happens next? Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah or bar Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus changed his name. He changed his name because he saw in Simon this rock-like conviction. And it, it was as though Jesus was saying, now that's the kind of man I can build my church on. Changed his name. And so Luke gives us an example of this. Here, Barnabas, or Joseph's name gets changed. And Luke now actually gives us an example of how 
Barnabas encouraged. Now, the apostles wouldn't have given him this name if they hadn't seen this in him in the first place. So there's stuff that's unrecorded about this man up to verse 36. But the apostles saw it, and they said, we've got to rename this guy. And now Luke gives us an example of the encouragement that the apostles saw. So verse 37, he sells some of his land, and he comes and he brings the proceeds, the money from the sale, and he lays it at the apostles' feet. Now, why did he do that? Why did he sell his land and give it away? Well, if you go back to the preceding verses, if you go back to verse uh, 34, there was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. You see, the church then was encouraged. People in the church were encouraged through Barnabas' giving of his resources. It's clear that this is a man who had a heart for people. People were more important to him than possessions. He wanted to meet the needs of others. He wanted to provide for the needy. He didn't see his land as his. He understood that what he had received from God was a gift, and he was to steward any physical resource that he had and to use it in the work of the Lord. Here's a man who did not have a it's mine attitude, but an it's yours mindset. His mindset was that God has blessed me, so how can I use what he has blessed me with to bless others? He encouraged the church. Secondly, what I want you to see in this story, by the way, we're going to be in Acts for a little bit here, and we're, we're going to flip through a few pages in Acts, so you really have to have your Bible with you this morning. Acts chapter 9, I want you to go to Acts 9 now. And I want you to see here that Barnabas encouraged Saul of Tarsus. Flip over to Acts chapter 9. And if you want to know just how far we're going, we're going all the way up to Acts chapter 15 this morning. So by the time, it, well, by the time we end, it won't be this morning anymore, okay? <laughs> just wanted to give you that in, encouragement. How's that? I'm using my gift. Chapter 9 is an incredible chapter in the book of Acts. What's the big thing that happens in Acts chapter 9? Luke records for us the story, the most famous conversion story ever, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who was the great persecutor of the church. This radical, extreme, terroristic rabbi who wanted to stamp out the early church. And so after we have his conversion story in the first part of chapter 9, we read that he goes into the city of Damas Damascus. You remember he was on his way there. He had written authorization in his hands to go into Damascus to persecute the believers of Jesus there, to bring about a campaign of terror against them. And he was arrested by Jesus as he was on his horse. He was knocked off of his horse. And the Lord Jesus changed him, and he goes into the city then, blinded by the light that he's seen, and the Lord sends Ananias to him. And Ananias comes alongside him. Ananias was an encourager. And he prayed over Saul, and he prayed for his healing, and Saul was filled with the Spirit, and his sight was restored. A miracle happened, and immediately Paul began to preach in the city of Damascus about the Lord Jesus. You can read that in verses 19 and 20, Acts 9. Paul, Paul, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, verse 20. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now you can imagine how those who were with Saul on the way to Damascus felt about what happened. And uh, all of the radical Jews in the city who, who were against the believers, particularly against Jews who were converting to faith in Christ. And so we read in verse 23 that they plotted to take Paul's life. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. Paul learned of their plan, next verse, and he escaped. And it's a, it's a dramatic a dramatic escape at night. And uh, when he escapes, he, he leaves the city. Uh, imagine this, he, 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 he's able to escape and, and to carry on. And then there's a period of time between verse uh, 25 and 26. But now in verse 26, he comes to Jerusalem. And what does he want to do? He's been converted. He's a believer now. 
It says here he wanted, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. So whether, when it was the, the radical Jews, they wanted to kill him. The terrified believers, they wanted nothing to do with him. You can imagine the fear that would have existed in the hearts of believers when Saul, who had persecuted so many that they loved, showed up at their door. Look at verse 27. But Barnabas, there he is, Barnabas. Barnabas took him, came alongside him, you see that? And brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul in his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas advocated for Saul. Barnabas worked with Saul. He worked on the situation that existed there. He worked in such a way with the other leaders in the church at Jerusalem so that Saul would be accepted by the church, embraced by God's people, loved by them, and he succeeded. What an encouragement this was to Saul, who had just recently come to faith in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 30. Again, the Jews in Jerusalem now want to, want to kill Paul. And um, so another plot to kill him. Verse 30, when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Caesarea is the port city. Tarsus is extremely north. It's in southern Turkey today. And uh, they send Paul or Saul back to the place where he was originally from. But notice it says the brothers did this. This is evidence that, that Barnabas' work of encouragement paid off. He not only encouraged Saul, he encouraged the brothers to accept Saul. And now loving this man Saul, they, they send him off where he can be safe. The disciples looked at Saul when he first came into the church, and all they saw was a problem. But Barnabas looked at Saul when he came into the church, and what Barnabas saw was potential. The disciples looked at Saul, and they saw his past. But Barnabas looked at Saul and saw his future. The disciples saw what Saul had been, but Barnabas saw what he could become. He was able to see a changed heart. He was able to see genuine conversion. And he was willing to take a chance to come alongside this persecutor of the church. He took risk, and the result was the brothers helped him. Now we come to the third example, or the third incident, in which Barnabas encouraged. And that is that Barnabas encouraged the church in Antioch. So skip from chapter 9 now, and I want you to jump all the way over to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. We're looking now beginning at verse 19. These are the verses that our brother Tom read for us this morning. So the opening verse tells us, verse 19, that there had been a persecution. We know about that. Happened during the time of Stephen. And um, the believers, of course, had been scattered out of Jerusalem. And it says they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus. Keep that in mind. That's where Barnabas is from, and Antioch. Antioch is in the northern extremity of Syria today, just south of the nation of Turkey today. So it's an extreme northern city from Jerusalem. But these who had been persecuted, it says they told the message only to the Jews. But some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And what happened? Well, the Holy Spirit came in power. The Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So the gospel is spreading. People are being added to the Lord in this Gentile city. And in verse 22, it tells us that news of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. So what are they going to do? Okay, this is a Greek-speaking city, and you've got people from Cyprus who are in this church. Ah, we know the guy to send. And they send Barnabas, verse 22. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. And notice what it says here. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. They sent the right man for the job because they knew that new believers need to be encouraged they need someone to come alongside side them. I love what it says in verse 23. It says, when he saw the grace of God. 
I, I think that word saw, past tense for seeing, is, is a key word because this is telling us that, that Barnabas could see deeper into what God was really doing here. Some of us miss it. We don't see it. But here's a man who discerned the workings of the grace of God in a man's heart, in many people's hearts. He was able to discern grace just as he had discerned the work of grace in Saul's life. He, he sees it in these believers in Antioch. In verse 23, it says he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord. He's using his gift. I love verse 24. He's a good man, full of the spirit and faith. Many more people are added to the Lord. You see, he was helping these new believers. He was forming them into a church. But look at verse 25. Verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Why? I mean, there's a spiritual awakening happening here. There are all kinds of people becoming believers, and and Barnabas is being so effective in in using his gift to, to encourage them to follow the Lord. Why would he go to Tarsus? I mean, Tarsus was 243 kilometers away. This is the day before cars or planes or trains. But he leaves and he searches for Saul. Verse 26, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Great numbers of people. You see, Barnabas knew Saul's gifts. He knew the character of the man. He knew the potential that Saul had. Saul is, in a sense, been put on a shelf the whole time he's staying in Tarsus. This is the man who's going to become the great apostle Paul, and he's inactive at this point in time. They're in fear because of, of the potential uh, plots, that, or these plots that potentially could have taken his life. He knew that, Barn, that, that Saul needed to be encouraged, and he knew that Saul could help him. And so Saul joined Barnabas' team, and they taught great numbers of people. In the midst of all of these multitudes of people coming to know the Lord, Barnabas never lost sight of the individual. And what's interesting here is how effective was this ministry of Barnabas and Saul? Well, look at the last line of verse 26. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Why weren't they called Christians before this? This is the first use of the word Christian as, as we know it today. Well, the word Christian, it, it's, it comes from the Latin word Christianus, which simply means a follower of Jesus, but here it, it's a little different. They were first called Christians in Antioch. The word literally means like little Christs or Christ-like ones. They were given this name at Antioch because people could see that these disciples that Barnabas was encouraging to mature in their faith were actually maturing in their faith and they were becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. They were called Christians there. We have to move fast because in the next few verses we read that a prophet came from Jerusalem and his name was Agabus and through the Holy Spirit he prophesied that a famine was coming, and so um, the disciples, verse 29, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul, by Barnabas and Saul. So off they go now to Judea, carrying this gift to help the believers there who are suffering in famine. This is famine relief. Go down now to chapter 12, verse 25. Chapter 12, verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, that is the mission of bringing this famine relief, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Okay, let's talk about the fourth incident now. And that is that Barnabas encouraged Saul to become Paul the apostle. He encouraged Paul the apostle. So now we're back at chapter 13. We're in chapter 13. We're back in the church at Antioch. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Who were they? Barnabas. Notice his name is at the top of the list. Why? He's the leader. He's the leader. You have a number of lists in the Bible of various men, apostles, and so on, and the leader was always at the top of the list. 
Peter is always at the top of the list. He was the leader among the 12. Barnabas, his name is at the top. Who, who was next? Simeon called Niger. Niger means black. This was a black man from Africa. Probably, uh, many believe that he was the, Niger means black, and, and many believe that he was the man who carried the cross of Jesus. His name was Simeon. Lucius of Cyrene. This is a Berber, a North African. Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Here's, here's a man who lived in the royal palace. And Saul, the radical Pharisee. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And that's exactly what they did. They laid hands on Barnabas and Saul because the Holy Spirit had spoke and they sent them out. Now I want you to notice in verse two, whose name comes first? Barnabas. Barnabas and Saul. Verse four. The two of them sent out on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, sailed from there to Cyprus. That's where Barnabas is from. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of the Lord in the Jewish syn- syn- synagogues. And look at, the, look at the next line. John was with them as their helper. Who's John, which John is this? This is John Mark. This is John Mark who writes the Gospel of Mark eventually. So Mark is there, and he's coming along to help, to help them. So they come to the island of Cy- Cyprus in verse 6. And it's very clear, they go all the way to Paphos, they go clear across the island, and then something happens. Now what happens is a turning point. What happens here is a significant moment. It is a a defining moment for Saul of Tarsus. What happens? Well, they they bump into this man who's a Jewish sorcerer, verse 6. He's a false prophet, and his name is Bar-Jesus, which means what? Son of Jesus. Listen, Jesus didn't have a son. Okay, so any movies you've watched about Jesus having a son through Mary Magdalene or, you know, the weird stuff that goes on. I'll tell you where its source is actually from. It's false prophet stuff. It's sorcery stuff. It comes from the demonic. Here's a man who is working in the realm of the dark, the dark arts. He was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul. Notice Barnabas' name is first because he wanted to hear the word of God. So here's a Roman in whom God is working. But what happens? Elymas, the sorcerer, who is also by the name of Bar-Jesus, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. What happens next? Saul says, we're not going to have anything of this. Like, we're not going to tolerate this. And it says in verse 9, then Saul, who was also called Paul. Now notice that. It's a key line here. There's, there's a name change that's taking place here. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He looks straight at this source, source, sorcerer and he says, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right way of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. You know, a lot of people say today, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if God did miracles like this right in front of our eyes? Listen, if he did, you'd be scared. You'd be scared. But an amazing miracle takes place. And as I said, this is a turning point, a defining moment, because two things happen now. Two things happen. It's already alluded to in verse 9, but it's, it's actually clear in verse 13. A change of leadership happens. From Paphos, Paul and his companions. See that? It's not Barnabas and Saul anymore. It's Paul and his companions. Now you go over to chapter 14, quickly now. Chapter 14, verse 12, they go into this Lyconian city and, and, and the people think that Barnabas and Saul are, are, are are gods. Verse 12, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker, meaning he's the leader of the team. A change has happened. Now go down to verse 40. Uh, go back to chapter 13, verse 42. 
as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the, syn- the, syn- the synagogue. See, the reversal of names. Verse 43, Paul and Barnabas. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. Go down to verse 49 or 50, actually. This st- they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. A name change happens. There's a change of leadership that's taken place here. But that's not the only thing that happens. Because look at chapter 13, verse 13 again. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Mark decided, I'm out of here. Now, there's no actual explanation that is given. But there's an interesting verse in, the, in, in Colossians chapter 4. Because in Colossians 4, Paul says that Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. I think what we see happening here is Mark saying, what, Paul's the leader now? My cousin isn't the leader anymore? I'm out of here. I don't want to be a part of this team if my cousin isn't the leader anymore. He didn't like the new leadership. See, Mark had a a problem with the new leader, but Barnabas didn't. Barnabas, Barnabas, when he now took second position, his heart did not change. Barnabas' zeal was not dampened. His spirit did not become bitter. His ego was not crushed. He accepted this. It didn't matter to him if Paul was now the leader of the team. As a matter of fact, I think this was the goal of Barnabas all along. That's why he went to Tarsus to get Saul, because he saw the potential in this man, and this is what he was hoping would actually happen. Now let's go to the fifth incident that happens in the story. Barnabas encouraged John Mark. Go all the way now to chapter 15. You see, I told you we were going to cover a lot of ground here this morning, and we're actually very close to the end. Verse 36, Acts 15, verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him. Why? Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed from Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul said, no, I don't want Mark coming. He, he deserted us. Like he's not fit to be on the team. And Barnabas, the encourager, is like, but Paul, <laughs> let's give him a chance. Let's give him a second opportunity. Who was right? Who was wrong? I mean, it kind of shocks us to think that this, this actually happened among these outstanding Christian leaders, that they disagreed with each other. Who was right and who was wrong? Well, let me read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4. These are the final words of the Apostle Paul. He's in, these are many years later. He's in prison in Rome. He has just said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race. In other words, he's talking about his impending death. He knows he's going to be persecuted. He's in this dank, dark cell, dungeon, and he writes to Timothy, gives him last-minute instructions, and then he says to him, Timothy, do your best to come. Come and visit me, please. Come fast, he says. Why? He says, Demas, a companion of his, has loved this world, and he's deserted me. Imagine that. Desert the Apostle Paul before he's going to be killed? And then he says, only Luke is here with me now. And listen to these words. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Isn't that amazing? Get Mark 
Bring him, he's helpful to me. Why? How could this man, John Mark, who deserted Paul, how could he become now someone that Paul says, I want him to come alongside me? How could this happen? Because Barnabas had taken his cousin, Mark, he came alongside him, he encouraged him, he corrected him, probably about his attitude toward leadership. And Mark grew, and he became useful to the Apostle Paul. And friends, that's what encouraging people do. They come alongside. They correct when it's necessary. They rebuke when it's necessary. They have frank talks with people who are wandering from the path of faith, but they do it in such a way that they're wooing them back and encouraging them to remain true to the Lord and to follow the Lord. Now, how does this relate to us today? I want to say five things really fast. Number one, the Lord has abundantly distributed the gift of encouragement to many in our church. And I, I, I could probably take five or ten minutes now. I won't, but I could. And just name a number of people who have this ministry of encouragement in our church. And there's probably names of people that are coming to your mind or pictures of their faces in your minds now because they are Barnabases within our church. But I believe that the distribution of this gift is much broader than we realize. And I say that because the Christian life is really a struggle And so the Lord would never leave his church without people who have this gift to come alongside those who are struggling with the deceitfulness of sin and are going wayward from their faith, giving up the habit of meeting with each other. You see, two things are really sure. You need encouragement and you need to encourage others. And so, friends, I, I believe that, the, that, that, that this gift is everywhere in our church. And, and I, I want to say to you that, that in terms of relational, relational stuff, relationally, you need to put yourself into a place, in a local church, in a small group, where you then have the opportunity to use this gift to encourage your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Number two, there's room for you. There's room for you to be a disciple maker, to be a Barnabas within our church. You you might look around and say, well, I don't really see where I could fit in here in this church. Listen, there is room for you. There is room for you to be a Barnabas, to encourage people to come to Christ, to follow Christ, to be changed by Christ. There's room for you to walk alongside people. Listen, at the end of service, when you get up out of your chairs, I can guarantee you within a two to three yard radius of where you're sitting right now, there's someone who needs to be encouraged. And we're all called to make disciples, to to come alongside them and help them to be true to the Lord. We talked about our Stephen ministers today, an announcement today about international students. What an opportunity for you to be a Barnabas to invite an international student into your home, to come alongside them, to encourage them as they're adjusting to Canadian culture and all the struggles that they have with that. And then to point them to the Lord Jesus. Number three, you, you, don't, you don't have to be a leader to be a, Bar, a Barnabas. I mean, that's what some of us think. I, I can't disciple anyone. I can't come alongside someone and, and, and help them along in their Christian journey. I'm, I'm not a leader. I'm not a teacher. But you can be a cheerleader. You can be a comforter and a counselor. You can be an encourager because we're all called to make disciples of the Lord Jesus. Fourth thing I want to say is that your encouraging influence is more than you can imagine. Barnabas was certainly used by God to bring about spiritual formation in many people, but the two individuals that stand out the most are Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, and John Mark. Now why are these two guys so significant to us today? Well, John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. He was the first one to write a gospel. He was the first one to record the life story of Jesus. How many books are in the New Testament? 27. 
How many, how many of those books did the Apostle Paul write? Thirteen. And you add John Mark, and you got 14 books. You got more than 50% of the New Testament writings were written by these two men. And that's the Bible we have in our hands today. Do you think Barnabas, when he came alongside John Mark and he came alongside Saul of Tarsus, do you think he had any idea that these guys would go on and write those books? Probably none whatsoever. And Barnabas isn't given the credit that he should have. But without his spiritual forming influence in their lives, you see, some things might not have happened or they would have happened differently. If I say the name Mordecai Ham, does anybody here know who Mordecai Ham was? Mordecai Ham. Nobody even knows him. You know who he was? He's the man who led Billy Graham to faith in Jesus Christ. And nobody even knows who he is. Spurgeon came to Christ when he was just a 14, 15 year old teenager. And he came to Christ under the preaching of a Methodist layman who had no experience in preaching at all. It was in the midst of a snowstorm and he had to preach that morning because the pastor couldn't get to the church to preach. And he wasn't that great of a speaker. But Spurgeon sat there in the service and heard the gospel and he was saved. And to this day, we don't know who that Methodist layman was. You get my point? My point is the final point, and that is there are Saul's and Mark's in our church. They're in our city, and they're in our homes, in your house. The church is filled with people that need encouragement, and they have great potential. People need a paraclete to come alongside them. You are a Barnabas to someone, aren't you? Is someone a Barnabas to you? It's possible that you might think about yourself right now and as you view yourself and your circumstances in life right now today, you're thinking, you know, I'm just not in a place where I can even imagine that I could be a Barnabas to someone else. And I would encourage you today, can I encourage you? Can I do the Barnabas thing to you today? I would encourage you today not to let that mindset rule you. Keep this in mind, that the more you encourage others, the more you will be encouraged. The more you give, the more you will receive. By helping someone else, you will actually help yourself. By strengthening someone else, you too will be strengthened. By lifting up the load of someone who's under a crushing weight, your load will actually be made lighter. Encouragement isn't something that perishes when you use it. It increases by giving it away. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, my prayer this morning is that you might baptize us with the spirit of encouragement. That you might cause us to discover the gifts that you've given to us so that we can use them here at West Highland to build others up in their faith. Lord, we don't magnify a man today. We magnify you today because you were the one who worked in Barnabas' life and you gave him the gifts that he had and you used him for your glory. But we do, Lord, aspire to be used by you to come alongside others who need help. Make West Highland, I pray, Lord, a place of encouragement. Make West Highland, Lord, a church of encouragement. Make West Highland, Lord, a place that is full of individuals who stream out of this place into our city and the surrounding areas to encourage people to follow the Lord and here within our context here to remain true to the Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now may God the Holy Spirit clothe you with encouragement as you seek to encourage others to follow Jesus. Amen.